is International Holocaust Memorial Day. I think, therefore, it is a perfect timing for us uh, to be holding this symposium today, which I have no doubt is going to be extraordinarily interesting and useful for all of us. May I, at the outset, we have an ambassador here for, for the first time. I'd like to uh, welcome the ambassador of Macedonia, Mr. Avirovic. Pleased to have you with us. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here to discuss the book that Manfred Gerstenfeld produced, his important new book, The Abuse of Holocaust Memory, Distortions and Responses. We're dealing here with a phenomenon which is increasingly dominating the agenda of anti-Semites all, at all levels and throughout the world. Until now, the major area of concentration when we talked about the Holocaust was Holocaust denial. But beyond the Arab world, and I don't discount that, but beyond the Arab world, Holocaust denial is largely concentrated amongst cranks. Sophisticated anti-Semites, in fact, steer clear of outright denial, realizing that in the long term it actually discredits them. But when we come to Holocaust trivialization, and in particular Holocaust inversion, these have become the major new instruments of the anti-Semites to demonize us. Trivialization, if you looked at the papers today, and I'm not going to dwell on it because we're uh, covered by our speakers, you have to look at the articles both in the Jerusalem Post and in Haaretz uh, about what's taking place in the Baltic Republics, where the attempt is being made to trivialize the Holocaust in a very sophisticated manner by simply bracketing it together with the crimes of, of Stalinism. I'm not going to go into that, our speakers will go into that, but that is an example. The real area that is endangering all Jews is the area that I consider to be the greatest libel against the Jewish people ever promoted, and that is Holocaust inversion. I need not remind you that this really has its genesis in the United Nations resolution promoted by the Soviets, Zionism as racism. But the attempt to bracket Israeli behavior with that of the Nazis has now become the centerpiece of the campaign against us, ranging from the Arab world through to the enlightened post-modernist secular Europe. That the descendants of the Holocaust are behaving like the Nazis is an idea which is being promoted everywhere, as I say, is the greatest defamation that we've ever encountered. It reached its climax with a Goldstone report which accused the IDF of systematically killing innocent Palestinians, and this subsequently led to the Nazi linkage which now dominates the anti-Israeli debate in relation to this. We are therefore indebted to our indefatigable chairman, Dr. Manfred Gerstenfeld, for having produced this extraordinarily important book at this time, which I believe everyone who is involved in any kind of Jewish or Israel advocacy should read and study. We will hear from Dr. Gerstenfeld presently, but to open this symposium, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Robert Rosette, who is the director of the library at the Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, and has, quote, ministerial responsibility for the visual center in Yad Vashem, in the Yad Vashem complex. His book, Approaching the Holocaust, Texts and Context, was published in 2005. He's the co-author of the Encyclopedia of the, of the Holocaust, published in association with the Yad Vashem, and many other books. Dr. Rosette is a specialist in this field, and uh, as far back as five years ago, he wrote an important piece in the American Jewish Weekly Forward, warning about the dangers inherent in the trivialization and inversion of the Holocaust. But I prefer to stop at this point and allow him to speak to you and convey his own message. Thank you, Dr. Rosette. Thank you for your kind introduction, and I'd like to thank Manfred for inviting me this morning to speak to you. Of course, Manfred's book puts the subject of the abuse of the Holocaust in a very clear and coherent fashion. And I have to admit that after I read it, I began thinking maybe I, have to, I can stop giving lectures on the subject and just tell people to read his book. Unfortunately, people don't read as much as they used to, so I don't think I'm going to be unemployed as a speaker in the near future. And of course, no book's perfect, and I can say that as a director of a library with 120,000 volumes in it. 
And so you can argue with Manfred here and there, perhaps, on something he said in terms of an interpretation or an emphasis, but you can't argue with the broad sweep that he set up in front of all of us in the book and all the various permutations of Holocaust abuse that exist in the world today. I think he's really covered everything. And I agree, it's a book that everybody needs to read. I also think that the book is a very sad testament of our times, that here we are in 2010 and this is what we're talking about, that people are abusing the Holocaust and all the time with new ways of doing it, or at least new, cha new things that have old roots. It's not so easy to think about how to speak about the abuse of the Holocaust in light of Manfred's book, because I said he puts everything on the table, as it were, and I don't want to repeat really the things that he's written about. <coughs> What he caused me to do is to think a little bit about where it's coming from. And I think that we can talk about people who manipulate the Holocaust on purpose as one group of people, and that's a very large group of people, and again, a very diverse group of people that manipulate the Holocaust. I think we can talk about some people who abuse the Holocaust, at least in part out of ignorance. And then the third group are those that are receptive to the ideas. They're the willing listeners, as it were. And they're the ones who find the arguments or the things that are put forth by those who abuse the Holocaust as reasonable and don't argue with it. And I'd like to say a little bit about that group right now. I'd like to talk about them a little bit. Again, as Manfred says in the book, and many others have said as well, the Holocaust has really emerged as the, the prominent model of man's ability to do evil. And I'm sure that we can argue that that's what it is. To a large extent, I think that we, those of us who deal in Holocaust education, commemoration, research, we have a certain responsibility for a situation that exists, and that's that the Holocaust has spread very far and wide around this globe of ours, but in many places it's spread very superficially. The spreading began very early, I mean, after the war, information about the Holocaust we all think that in the first year survivors didn't speak about the Holocaust, but there's a lot been written lately that shows us that that's not true. Some 200 memoirs by survivors were published in the first years after the Holocaust, in the first few years after the Holocaust, in the first five years. And of course many memoirs since. I think our library now holds about 9,500 memoirs by survivors, so that's an ongoing proposition. There are some books, movies, and other things, again, that did a great service in spreading a certain understanding of the Holocaust. Of course, the most famous of them all is Anna Frank's Diary, which first was published in Dutch in 1947, and has come out in 65 languages, including in Basque and Khmer and Nepalese and Armenian and you know a host of other languages that you might not think about when you're thinking about the Holocaust. Even unauthorized versions of that diary began coming out in the 1980s in China. The film that was released in 1959 also had its role in spreading information about the Holocaust. And many people talk about that film as being some sort of denuded of Jewish, of its Jewishness. They talk about the film and the play as having very little Jewish content in them. And I can't speak about sensibilities in 1959 when it came out, but I recently saw the film again. We showed it at Cinematheque not too long ago. And actually I was surprised how Jewish how clear to me it was that they were Jewish. And I can't tell you if that's because of my sensibilities or because the film's really doing that well, but it seems to me it actually does quite clearly show that they're Jewish. But anyway, the film had a tremendous impact, as did the diary. There's a book that's just come out last year by a woman named Hasha Diener. And it's a book that discusses America and the response of the American Jewish community to the Holocaust in the 1940 six, forty-five, until the Eichmann trial. And really she goes against the common wisdom. The common wisdom again is that survivors were not speaking, the community wasn't interested, they weren't engaged, and once again, not a perfect book, you can argue with things in it, but you can't argue with what she shows is so much activity going on, relatively, and so much discussion about the Holocaust, and she shows that it's really going on all the time through the 1950s, but she also says something near the end of the book in her conclusion, which I think is very true, and that's in the 1970s, there's a quantum leap in the discussion about the Holocaust. And so much more is being said from the 1970s onward. For many of us, we date it with the film, that Holocaust TV drama, you know, on the Weiss family that came out in 1978, 
a hundred million Americans viewed it and then it went to Europe and it caused a lot of discussion in Germany and other places and it's a really a landmark thing in terms of the discussion of the Holocaust around the world. Another film that we often talk about as being landmark in terms of, of the, spreading the, the message or a, a message or an understanding of the Holocaust is Schindler's List, which is a later film, 1993, but in the first year it was shown in 29 countries, including places like the Philippines and Uruguay and Peru, again places where you don't think too much about the Holocaust, although there are survivors in some of those places, of course, at least in Uruguay and Peru. And once it comes on TV, then it goes even farther, of course. Books like The Winds of War and War and Remembrance, I learned when I was in China several years ago that Chinese people that have an interest, and there are some that have an interest in our subject, tell me that it was Anna Frank's diary and The Winds of War and War and Remembrance that brought them into the subject. Those were the two books that they read, or the three books, since uh, War and Remembrance, Wind of, Winds of War is two books, and then the dramatization that was also made, and those were very important for them. Um, on a whole, also, then the last book I just want to mention, of course, is something like Night, Elie Wiesel's book, which recently, in 2006, was a book in Oprah Winfrey's book club, which meant that many, many people who would never read a memoir about the Holocaust started reading a memoir about the Holocaust because they're part of that book club. And it also had a big influence in spreading ideas. So it's not hard to trace what happens. I mean, I just gave you a few highlights in the way Holocaust spreads around and is spread around the world. There is a whole other level that we need to mention and Manfred also mentions in his book about the International Task Force on Holocaust Education, which begins in 1998. Today there's 27 countries that belong to it, and there are several countries that would like to join it and are working to reach the standards that are necessary to join that organization. And they deal with teaching the Holocaust uh, in, uh, in supporting research on the Holocaust around the world. And then what's going to happen tomorrow, the 27th of January. The fact that the UN in 2007 and 2005 established a date as International Holocaust Remembrance Day is also important signpost in our understanding, again, how far the Holocaust has gone, that the UN would adopt such a thing. Um, I have a friend who is in charge of the unit in the UN in dealing with Holocaust Remembrance Day. And she has officers around the world, and you know, in Africa and in Asia, that go through and have gone through a, uh, a learning day about how then to deal with with uh, commemorating this day on the 27th of January. It doesn't mean that they all do it, or they all do it to our satisfaction, but it's going on. So that also tells us about this spread and how far it's spread. What I'd like to say is that in my feeling, the spreading of the Holocaust, many people understand it though, as I said, superficially in what we might call in an iconic way. Um, again, in his book, Manfred talks about this too. He doesn't use this terminology, but he does talk about it. When he's talking about Anna Frank, for example, he talks about, well, you learn certain things from Anna Frank, but there's things you don't learn from Anna Frank's diary. And you don't learn, for example, that there was so much Dutch complicity in the murder of the Jews. It doesn't come out in the diary, not in a clear way. We don't learn about the secretary generals and all their role, and of many bureaucrats and others, in the murder of the Dutch Jews. And I might say that if you see that Anna Frank is the icon, iconic victim, well, you learn certainly about what happened to her from her diary, not from the diary, but from her story in general. But we don't learn about many other kinds of victims in the Holocaust and many other ways people were murdered. And not everybody has Anna Frank's experience. Not everybody went through camps. Not everybody, obviously, uh, not everybody died in Bergen-Belsen from disease. There's many ways people are dying in the Holocaust, being murdered in the Holocaust. Dying is not the right word. And that doesn't come out with this kind of iconic thing. But if she is a symbol of the, of the victim, and if that's what you know, then there's many things you don't know. You can talk about Elie Wiesel in the same way as an iconic survivor. And we learn many things from his story about people being deported to Auschwitz as late as 1944 with their entire families. And we learn from his story about what it's like to be in Auschwitz if you read Night or if you read his autobiography. And you also learn how important it was for him to be bonded with his father, which is a very important part of the experience of people in these camps. Again, in survival, it's so important. And then the loss of the father and being the only remnant of his family, all of these things are very true. But you don't learn about many other aspects of the experience of survivors. And you certainly don't learn about the survivors who might have spoken about the Holocaust but didn't get a Nobel Prize for doing so and didn't become iconic figures, really, in the public imagination. But there were more normative people speaking and writing or, or speaking in the family or, or whatever they were doing. So again, there's a problem with that too. Schindler's List I mentioned. 
And Schindler is the iconic rescuer these days. There are a few others, of course, but he's one of the iconic rescuers. And again, from his story, you learn many things about what happened in the Holocaust. We even learn how somebody so high up in the German world, in the German Nazi world, can become a rescuer, which is an important thing to learn. But I would submit that he's far from a, a symbol, really, of the rescuers. We have 23,000 righteous among the nations we've recognized at Yad Vashem, and everyone is different. I don't think there's an iconic representation. I think that each has their own story, and they're so different. There's people like like a Schindler, but there's also the diplomats, people like Wallenberg and Sugihara, and there's army officers. There's a fellow named Vilmos Nadbatroni, who is somebody that I've been working on a little bit in my own research, who is helping Hungarian forced laborers in his position as a general in charge of the Eastern Front for the Hungarians, later on as the defense minister, and he was rewarded righteous among the nations, actually, for trying to make their conditions better. There's priests like Andrei Trokma in the, in the Chambon, and civil servants like Irena Sendler, and again, a host of others. So you learn something, of course, from Schindler as a rescuer, but not everything about rescuing. And you don't learn anything from his story about Jews who are trying to rescue themselves, which is a very important aspect of rescue. Jews who are making efforts either on small family level or sometimes on community level, like the working group in Slovakia who are so involved in this general rescue. None of this comes out. Another thing from the film, though, that does come out is the, an iconic murder, and that's Amin Gerth. And you, nobody can ever forget what they saw in that film of him standing on a balcony shooting Jews, right? That's the iconic Imer. What a, what a murderer. But what kind of murderer is he? He's a murderer who's not sane. We see him as a bloodthirsty and insane man standing on his balcony shooting people. And that's not really like all the murderers, of course. Eichmann is another iconic murderer, and Eichmann is a desk murderer, <coughs> even though he's in the field a few times. But we all see him as the desk murderer. That's another icon. And then that's so similar, than the, so different, I'm sorry, than the murderers that's like those that are talked about in Chris Browning's important book, Ordinary Men, where he talks about many reasons in addition to Nazism and anti-Semitism why men became murderers. I think that you can argue with him about the emphasis he gives to anti-Semitism and Nazism, if he gives enough or not enough, but he does us an important service by showing that in addition there are other factors like peer pressure and conformity that can take a group of men who are essentially older men who weren't really from a Nazi, strong Nazi stronghold of Nazism there from Hamburg become murderers, and they eventually killed 38,000 Jews and deported almost 50,000 more. And again, he explains a lot about their motivations in addition to those that we already know about. So all of that you don't get looking at something like Schindler's List. The last thing I want to talk about iconographically before I go on to the next part of the lecture is about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Hasid Diner in the book that I mentioned shows how much the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in America in the 50s and 60s became one of the ways people commemorated things. She says many latched on to that as a way to commemorate. And I can tell you that already in 1944, late 1943, the representatives of the Jewish agency sitting in Istanbul sent a message to Budapest to Kostner and his committee telling them they should prepare for an uprising like the Warsaw Ghetto. In other words, they already saw that as the response, the ultimate response. And certainly it becomes the way we see resistance for many of us. And it's, it's true that not everybody always saw it that way. And in early discussions in Yad Vashem, people are already talking about other kinds of resistance, not just armed resistance. And certainly by the 1970s and 80s, we're teaching about other kinds of resistance. But if you only know the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which again, many people, that's what they know, then that's resistance. They don't understand there's spiritual resistance, there's hiding, there's false papers, there's all kinds of other things that people are doing. There's partisans, you know, now the Belsky book uh, came out as a film that might help people understand that there were Jewish partisans out there who were fighting mm -hmm. to justify their existence, but were rescuing Jews. That's really what they were doing. So all of that doesn't come out with the icons. Now, I think in much of the world people don't even know all these icons I'm talking about. Maybe they only know one or two of them. I, mean, I can't say that they know them all. I don't know what they know. But certainly this two-dimensional understanding that they give us is very problematic. And I think that it allows people to accept, again, these things that they hear. If you have a simplistic understanding of the Holocaust, then how will you understand when somebody says something to you that doesn't make sense? How can you evaluate? You just don't have the tools to do it. The equations that we see out there with the Holocaust, again, Manfred writes about them, about abortion and other things that are equated to the Holocaust. You need a better understanding of the subject in order to understand why those equations don't work. 
Because superficially, they might make sense to you. I mean, on a superficial level, if you don't think too deeply, you don't know too much, then they might make sense to you. Another thing I think that the superficiality <coughs> lends to is, again, something else that Manfred talks about that's Holocaust fatigue. People say, we've heard enough about the Holocaust. We don't want to hear any more. Why do they say it? Well, again, in some reasons, because they're manipulating. They want to say, make a statement like that because they have an agenda. But in some places, it's because they're hearing the same things every year. People aren't going into any depth, and they're tired. How many times can you talk about the same thing? Young people will say, I already heard that. And so that's one of the things I think, that leads to Holocaust fatigue, or certainly contributes to it. The other thing is, uh, again, that uh, Z. Liebler talked about, tomorrow's Holocaust Remembrance Day. And in some places in the world, they mark Holocaust Remembrance Day internationally without talking very much about the Jews. And I think that also the superficial understanding allows them to do it as well. Part of it, maybe even related to Holocaust fatigue, we've already talked about this. And then part of it, if you don't know the Holocaust more about it, then you don't understand why it's important to talk about it. So there could be some goodwill people out there that think, well, you know, that happened long ago. Rwanda's much fresher. We need to talk about that. Darfur is fresh. We need to talk about that. And of course, they need to be talked about. Nobody's saying they shouldn't be talked about. There are important things that were out there. But you can't take the Holocaust out of the equation here, but if you don't understand enough about it, you may well do it, because you don't understand why it, why it needs to be discussed. I think here, standing on the eve of Holocaust, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, it's important to bring up one other point about how the world talks about the Holocaust. Often, they move it into the level of discussing racism, genocide, and human rights. And of course, those are all very, very important subjects. Nobody would say that they're not. But they managed to talk about them without the Holocaust. And I would submit that you can't talk about any of them without including the Holocaust. The Holocaust is integral to all those discussions. Because if the Nazis weren't racist, what were they? And genocide as an idea comes out because it came to describe what happened to the Jews in World War II. That's where the whole idea of genocide comes as a discussion. Genocide conventions passed in 1948, very much it's on the background of what happened to the Jews in World War II. So how can you talk about future genocides without that important background to it? And then certainly human rights as well, because the, the Declaration of Human Rights is passed, is adopted by the UN the day after the Genocide Convention. And it also has to do with what happened in the Holocaust more than anything else. So you can't have a discussion about human rights without, again, relating to the Holocaust. But in order for people to understand this, they have to get beyond the very superficial understanding. So what do we do? Well, Manfred has a whole chapter. He writes about what do we do. And I'll put on my Yad Vashem hat right now. My Yad Vashem hat says that a central answer to what we do is education. And whenever I talk about education and Holocaust, I always think of something, like a story from a long time ago that I heard from the late uh, George Mosser, Professor George Mosser. Um, I had the privilege of taking classes with him. And he once said, you know, once I was, I remember when I was young, you would be sitting on a train, say, and somebody would say to you, the Jews are out to take over Germany. And you would take out a card, and you would read the answer that since the end of World War I, there have been so many ministers in Germany, and only so many of them Jews, and that would prove that the Jews aren't out to take over Germany, because it was such a small percentage. When I became director of the library at Yad Vashem, I learned what he was talking about. It's something called the anti-anti. And the anti-anti was put out by the Jewish community, I think from 1929 until around the time the Nazis come in in 33. And it's flashcards. It's a series of flashcards giving you answers. It's education. It's truth <coughs> against lies. I mean, what's more education than truth against lies? Did it work? No. <laughs> it didn't work, obviously, but it was important. So I always think about, you have to think about education with a lot of humility. But still, it's our answer as far as I'm concerned. Manfred notes in his book that Yad Vashem in 2008 held 60 international seminars for teachers. Last year we held 90 such seminars. Every seminar has a ripple effect. A teacher goes back and they teach their 30 or 50 or 100 students and they teach for the next 10 or 15 or 20 years and they have influence on the teachers around them. And there's a tremendous ripple effect to such things. And it's so important. It's the work in the field. It's where you really touch people. Seminars that we've done recently for media people and for young politicians, I think those are also very important, trying to give them tools to understand better where the Holocaust fits so that they will understand when it's being abused. 
Those are so important. I'm not so naive to say that if you sit down a young politician for three days and give him a seminar, he comes back and he really knows. But you add to his understanding, and there is something very important in that. Of course, our main problem is in those pl places in the world where we don't have a foothold. And how do we deal in education in those places where we don't have a foothold? And of course, part of the answer is media and internet. That's very important. So Yad Vashem is an internet site that's in English and in Hebrew and in Arabic and in Persian and in Spanish. And we have YouTube today also in a number of languages, channels. It's very important to get to people. It's not, again, it's not a full educational seminar, but when you put out a series of lectures in Persian for people or translate it into Persian, maybe it helps somewhere. Maybe it helps them. We hope that it does. And of course, things like the ITF, the International Task Force on Holocaust Education, one of the things you can do through that is to get people who work on that task force who do have a foothold in places where we don't in order to help us. I mean, they can help us with those things. That's what's so important, or one of the things that's so important about the international um, bodies. Ultimately, again, I think the iconic understanding of the Holocaust needs to be seen differently. It shouldn't, can't be the end. Somebody reading Anna Frank's <coughs> diary shouldn't stop with Anna Frank's diary. We have to find a way to get them to make that the starting point so then they go off and they read a lot of other things or see other films and, or listen to the lectures on YouTube or whatever's out there so that they learn more. And if I look at myself at Yad Vashem and many people in this room, I say that this is our job. We have to make sure that that happens. Exactly how, I don't have the answer, but I know we have to make sure that that happens, that the world doesn't stop with the iconic mm -hmm. representations, that they go beyond it. And I have a, a sad and sinking feeling that if we don't manage to do that, when Manfred comes to write a sequel, the book's going to be twice as big as the one he just wrote. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, when we talk about Holocaust commemoration and we result in the fact that it's now become an international commemoration, I must confess that I have mixed feelings because sometimes I have the feeling that too many of these people, uh, if they are mourning Jews, they're mourning dead Jews and not concerned about living Jews. And moreover, as has already been said, many of them are broadening it to such an extent that it's becoming meaningless. And before I call on Dr. Gerstenfeld, I just want to say that the ultimate extension of this is what I said at the beginning. The ultimate extension of this is the inversion of the Holocaust, utilizing the Holocaust as a vehicle to besmirch us. And to me, this is the most damning indictment. This is the center piece, I feel, of this book that Dr. Gerstenfeld is indefatigable because this man continues producing and he produces good stuff. But this, to my mind, is one of the most important timely books that he's produced and it's my great pleasure to call on you, Manfred. Mr. Ambassador, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thanks to Izzy and Robert for their very kind words. I also want to express my thanks to the Anti-Defamation League which is represented here by its Israel Office Director, Phyllis Gerabli, who has been extremely helpful in getting this book uh, out, which otherwise might not even have been here today and remained a promise. <coughs> I asked myself, uh, okay, something which is not in the book, what's my own experience with the uh, uh, abuse of Holocaust memory? Well, my first experience with the abuse of Holocaust memory took place in Amsterdam after the Second World War. The Dutch public was told by its leaders and the media that during the occupation from 1940 to 1945 the Dutch population had shown great resistance to the Germans. Well, I at the time didn't realize that collective memory and history were being massively manipulated. There were indeed, and we should be grateful for that, many tens of thousands of Dutchmen who had risked their lives in very different resistance activities, of which the hiding of Jews was only one. That we always have to realize because most resistance people had nothing to do with hiding Jews. 
But on the other hand, there were also 25,000 Dutch volunteers in the Waffen-SS, <laughs> the highest number in Western Europe, and a large number of uh, people who collaborated with the Germans in various ways. At least 100,000 people were members of the pro-Nazi party, NSP. Others collaborated in less explicit ways. Retroactively, however, after the war, a huge number of people found out that they had been resistors. There is a resistance museum in Amsterdam, and I already wrote long ago in an essay that finally there should also be next to it a museum for the Dutch traitors. Why could I not have known at that time that collective memory and history were being manipulated and that people were whitewashing their own past and the past of their country? First of all, easy to explain, I was only a child at the time. Secondly, the resistance activities had been done illegally, and now the media was presenting them in a greatly overstated way, but you couldn't check it out. It was all illegal. There were no counter voices who said it isn't true. And thirdly, fact is, my parents and I had indeed been saved by righteous Gentiles, which made the story credible. Unfortunately, the Jews actively helped to support this false image of the great Dutch resistance. Every day, every school day, when I was a high school kid, I passed the ugly monument which the Jews had erected in 1950 in honor of those Dutch people who saved their lives. That was the first monument concerning the Holocaust in the Netherlands. Tanks of the Dutch Jewish community, which had greatly been murdered, uh, to the Dutch population. Now, the Amsterdam municipality had opposed the Jewish community's request to erect a monument in the heart of the Jewish quarter, on the square where the, to the, the Portuguese and Ashkenazi synagogue stands. The Ashkenazi synagogues were in, uh, were in total, hardly, really only ruins stood there. And the idea was to record there, in the heart of the Amsterdam Jewish quarter, in front of these two synagogues, more than 100,000 Jews who had been murdered, which is 75%, close to 75% of the Jewish population of the Netherlands. But the Jewish community backed off because the municipality had really ideas which later uh, also expressed themselves in the communist world. There is no difference between the Dutch victims. The Jews were different during the war, and the Dutch government did do, in exile didn't do a bloody thing. Uh, but after the war, we are all equal. Now, on that same square, a monument called the Dog Walker was erected in 1952. It memorialized the two-day strike by large numbers of the Amsterdam workers in solidarity with the Jewish population. And if you go to the Van Leer Institute, you can see a small replica of the Dog Walker. The M.H. Hans, the, then the editor of the Jewish Weekly NIW, wrote in an editorial <coughs> that a monument like that has its merits, but shouldn't be put up in the heart of the Jewish quarters. And he said, it was like a monument to the anti-aircraft batteries on the grave of those who had been killed by a bombardment. Well, it would also take me decades to understand that during the war, the Dutch Queen Wilhelmina, who spoke on the radio regularly from London, had devoted in total during the whole war five sentences to the Jews who were being persecuted. And the Dutch government in exile had no interest whatever in what was happening to the Jews, the persecuted Jews. And of course, if you speak about the Netherlands, you cannot do without Anne Frank. It has been uh, mentioned here, an iconic figure. The Anne Frank Institute has made its own major contribution to falsifying history. Um, you have seen here movies by Willy Lindwer. Uh, the Amsterdam Jewish communities hated the Anne Frank uh, Foundation in the years after the war because they were falsifiers. Its absolute summum was when Willy Lindwer, who <coughs> made a movie on the last uh, seven months of Anne Frank's life, after she, uh, she had been captured and uh, sent to concentration camps, and the Anne Frank Foundation refused to collaborate and said, you cannot film in, our, in the Anne Frank house. We do not, icons shouldn't die, shouldn't be seen dying. So that was perhaps the high point of uh, falsification. Now, on another subject. One of the interesting things I found out when I was writing this book uh, was that once you become aware of it, 
uh, Holocaust issues continue to come up all the time, even 65 years after the end of the war. Of course, you see them as incidents and you don't see them together. When I started to write this book, uh, all the time while I was writing, uh, there, there were things happening which got a lot of international media attention. If you read the book, you find that in, in the early parts. And, uh, of course, since I finished this book, I don't look at it so intensely. But you cannot avoid it. book, uh, last pages of it were written in September. And I, uh, before preparing for today, I asked myself, okay, what has reached the international media since September? And then you have, of course, the publicity giving to Pope Benedict's uh, uh, agreement to take another step forward toward the sainthood of Pius XII, which raised this whole Holocaust past. And it won't be the last time that uh, uh, Pius XII's very, very ambiguous Holocaust past will come up. And the next item, to totally unrelated, was the stealing of the sign of Auschwitz at the entrance of Auschwitz. And it was a highly symbolic act, and it drew attention to the fact that neo-Nazism is alive and kicking. And the third thing is the Demjanuk trial, which is another matter, how matters, how example of how matters concerning the Holocaust remain in today's public conscience. And then there was the visit of Pope Benedict to the synagogue in Rome again, and that brought again up uh, the, the past of Pius XII during the Holocaust. And I'm sure that if we meet a year from now, you can just extend this because this is structural. These are not, the cases may be incidents, but the phenomenon is structural. I've now keep, been keeping track for it for almost a year and a half. It just keeps coming, coming up. And it's not only the international interest which is remarkable, it is also things which are more limited. Two cases, one can read today in uh, Arvets, even though the issue is known and is mentioned in, uh, in my book and has also been discussed this morning in one form or the other. That's the Prague Declaration, the desire of the European Union to have a memorial day which will, uh, which will re remember the victims of communism and it is quite obvious that that day in August ultimately will be merged with Holocaust Memorial Day. And then we are back where we started. All the Dutch were the same, of course, all their victims. I mean, uh, in the, brings me back to something which I didn't even think about. In the restitution negotiations, uh, uh, the Dutch Prime Minister, Wim Kok, said to the Dutch negotiators, Jewish negotiators, yes, my parents have also suffered. Uh, fortunately enough, there was somebody courageous enough to say that to you, but, but they, were on, they were alive after the war, uh, Minister Koch, isn't that it was so? Said to him. What? It was said to him. Yeah. It was said to sure. him. The answer was immediately response, was given, like you say now, to the son. What? The response said, that's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. It was given directly to Koch at that moment. Yeah. So, so that is the issue of equivalence of communists suffering under the communists and uh, equivalence of suffer, suffering under the Nazis. I mean, Lithuania is a pioneer in the field, but the other, several other Europe, Eastern European countries are masters of it as well. And the uh, European Union is already, hundreds of parliament members are supporting this, uh, this uh, idea of a Memorial Day for Communism. <coughs> but there are also things which haven't even made the newspapers here, even though I've made an effort to get it into Haaretz. And that is, in Sweden, the Social Security Agency refused to pay the pension of a Holocaust survivor because she had received a payment from Germany for having been in a concentration camp. And what did the security Social Insurance Agency say? Well, we cannot pay you two, two, two pensions, you have already received a pension for your voluntary work in a camp in, in uh, Eastern Europe. Well, this, the lowest German, uh, the lowest Swedish court, the Gothenburg Administrative Court of Appeal, said that is quite a reasonable position. It's only last week that uh, the decision was overturned by Sweden's uh, Supreme Administrative Court. Well, that doesn't make the international press, but it certainly uh, made, the, made the Swedish press. Now, to a third subject, Holocaust studies. 
course, Holocaust studies have uh, created a tremendous interest in uh, in finding out what really happened, and it is a very good tool to, with all its shortcomings, to counter abuse of memory and histories. And Holocaust scholars I talk to ask themselves, is it just a blip? Will it stay? Or will it disappear? Let's face it, the public interest in the Second World War in general has largely diminished. So will Holocaust go the same way? And the idea to think that indeed there's a community today of 250 Holocaust scholars, uh, that it will disappear is supported by the idea what's the strongest element if you deal with Holocaust memory that has survival testimonies. And as these people mm -hmm. die, and in fact, survival testimonies today means child survivors' testimonies. Mm -hmm. There are very, very few people, their adults, uh, at the end of the war, who are still able to. There are a few, but uh, there are very, very few. Today, the people who are there are, uh, are, 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 ch are their children at the end of the war. And then the idea is Deborah Lipstadt expressed it here once is, well, ultimately, the historian will take the place of the survivor which, in my opinion, is uh, is a totally different ball game. If you have listened to a historian or you have listened to a survivor, the impact is dramatically different. And then the question is, can a limited number of uh, of historians compensate for the uh, impact of direct testimonies from survivors? And another question which is also very important, will significant funds remain available for all the Holocaust memorial institutions and for additional research, because without money there is no research. I still, despite all this, I believe that the Holocaust will continue to be in the international awareness for a number of quite unpleasant reasons. The first and foremost is that the totalitarianism, uh, which was there in the Second World War, which was there in a different way in, under communism, is today found in a third current in important parts of the Muslim world. Muslim groups have not yet committed, ge not yet, I say, committed genocide out of ideological reasons. They have already done so for racist reasons in uh, Sudan. And given the chance, this is likely to be followed by mass murders for ideological reasons. And you cannot fool all the people all the time by inverting the Holocaust and saying that Israel is a Nazi state. If you look today in the world, they, who are closest to the Nazis, what is the ideology? Closest to the Nazis, let's politely call it jihadism, and jihadism is not going to go away. And the second reason is that the Holocaust will not disappear from the world attention, is that we are heading toward a much more disorderly, chaotic world. Jihadism is a major contributor to this, it's not the only one. And in a chaotic world, you need a metaphor for evil a multifaceted metaphor for evil. And as long as nothing happens which is clearly worse, uh, the Holocaust will remain that metaphor. Uh, as we progress in time, and has been mentioned here also, uh, the distortions of the Holocaust will become increasingly sophisticated. And so, what did I want to do? I said, let's create the tools uh, for analyzing them, so that you have the categories and then when uh, you have the categories, uh, each case you have, you can put it in one of the eight major boxes, and these eight boxes cover uh, 97 or 98 percent of, of the cases. So, uh, you have here the eight categories, they, each of them has a chapter in the book, and uh, the strange thing which I found when writing this book is, that so little has been written about it. You have here eight categories, and uh, you could still write a quite decent book on abuses uh, if, there, if all these eight categories had been written up, because then you would have been the person who took the books on these eight categories and integrated them. But that was totally impossible, because there is only one topic where you can say uh, it has decently been treated by, uh, by research. That's Holocaust denial. Main books, of course, are Deborah Lipstadt, uh, Scherber and Grobman, uh, also in France, uh, analyzing uh, the cases at Lyon University, Lyon 3 University. Uh, Holocaust denial is a 
I won't say it, it's a milked out subject, but it's certainly a subject which, uh, for, in order to write about Holocaust denial, this book was absolutely necessary, not necessary. Then the question is, what else did I have? Well, on deflection. Deflection, or which says more or less what the kid says in school. Uh, yes, uh, somebody threw a stone through the window, but it wasn't me, it was him. Uh, that uh, the, the Romanians, of course, didn't kill Jews. 400,000 uh, Jews died there, uh, murdered there, but not uh, by the Germans and the Austrians. Well, at least in the Romanian version. So there is work done. Shafrir is one of them, uh, and Sh uh, Michael Shafrir from Cluj University in, Ro in Romania, who have written on single countries the, on the idea of deflection, how these countries try to blame for what uh, happened there on others. And that is, uh, focuses only on, on, Eastern, uh, on Eastern Europe. So that was at least something. Another issue where you can find uh, a little bit is, of course, the Judaization, the Anne Frank case, uh, has because of the play, because of the uh, uh, of the movie, has raised this issue of uh, let's remember that this person happened to be a Jewish and that she wasn't persecuted because she was Anne Frank, but she was persecuted a Jew. But the de-Judaization concept of uh, uh, in general is not the subject which has been raised. Of course, the greatest de-Judaizers. Uh, for a long time were the communists. Everybody was equal, everybody suffered. And you do not, uh, the suffering of one person isn't, isn't bigger than the suffering of another person. And then, uh, uh, that is the easy way to get out of the specific suffering. Now, Holocaust uh, inversion is which is in fact the Nazification of Israel, is certainly most dangerous of the many abuses of Holocaust memory. There is no literature of any significance on the subject. If you look, even at um, if you look at the term Holocaust inversion, I think there is one person besides myself who uses it. Uh, there is nothing ever written, even though it is, as easy rightly said, it's the most dangerous phenomenon of today, and it's another phenomenon sign of how ineffective the Israeli government and authorities are in, in understanding the software of the total war, and much better in the military war than in understanding something about the software war. Now, here you have an example which I like, uh, in a certain way, to, of Holocaust inversion. This comes out the third largest Norwegian daily dark blood, and it's Ehud Olmert, uh, shown as a concentration camp commander. And the guy who made this, uh, this is a mainstream tabloid, still a mainstream journal in Norway. And uh, the guy who made this, uh, who made this cartoon, a guy called Finn Graf, the left wing, left wing are born in Germany. He, uh, he got a year later, he got the highest award from, of, which exists in Norway for his graphic work, the St. Olaf order, and was given to him by the king of Norway. Uh, trivialization is another uh, example of which there is no overview. I mean, we all know about the abortion holocaust and the animal holocaust has been brought to our plates for a long time. Uh, but nobody has understood what, how do all these fit, things fit, uh, fit together. Is there a difference between the smoking holocaust and the abortion holocaust and the animal Holocaust is an ideology, a common ideology behind it, and it's a subject which has never, never been treated. And the same goes for another category in the two of which I devote a, a chapter. And if you destroy a Holocaust monument or you besmirch it, if you demolish a building, you don't put a plaque on it, uh, which a building which had a role in the Holocaust. And if you try to turn Holocaust Memorial Day into General Genocide Day, all this is the same phenomena. It is Holocaust memory obliteration. Saying same also is if you say uh, the Jews talk too much about the Holocaust. You want to push this out of society, and it has never been looked at in its uh, totality. Now, I was last night at a forum of French speakers in, in Tel Aviv, and uh, a well-known journalist said there, "Yeah, it's all very simple. 
why we have all this it's because of the guilt of the Europeans because these are all simple answers and they are true but they are only a very small part of the truth mm -hmm. so <clears throat> I started to look into what are the motivations what makes people move and well, the most obvious is anti-semitism and anti-israelism if you are if you are anti-Jewish, uh, you hit where the Jews, where it hits hardest, and it doesn't hit very hard if you say that God didn't appear at Sinai, but if you start talking about the Holocaust uh, and that it didn't exist or uh, uh, that it helps Jews to, to get money or so, that, uh, that hurts. So you hit the people, if you are an anti-Semite, you want to hit, uh, hurt Jews, you do that. Uh, indeed, it's a very valid point to get rid of the, gold of, uh, the guilt of your ancestors, of your country. Uh, uh, these, these manipulations are interesting. If you, <coughs> deflection is beautiful. Uh, the great deflectors in history were the Austrians. The Austrians were the first victims of the, uh, of, the uh, of, of Nazism. That's why half of the population of Vienna stood there to applaud Hitler. Uh, so, that is the second reason. But there are many other reasons which people do not re realize. Some people distort the Holocaust in order to get publicity. Uh, it's like, I uh, always say, like global warming, a climatologist can never get any article in the media unless he promises that we will all burn or we will all freeze. If he says so, it's the most reasonable thing that temperature will moderately increase as a result of, uh, uh, of industrial activity, uh, that you don't go very far with that in, in the media. And there is another thing, is that it has been mentioned here, and everything which is totally, totally ne neglected, which is copycatting peer pressure. If you are senior professors in your discipline at your liberal university, are uh, Holocaust inverters, and tell that Israel is a Nazi state. If you want to make a career in that field, it uh, doesn't cost you anything to uh, repeat what they are saying. Uh, you, you don't even have to believe it or to, to research it. And some manipulations of Holocaust memory have very little to do with Jews or with anti-Semitism. It's often the case with what I call Holocaust equivalents. If you call the American presidents Bush or Obama, Hitler or a Nazi, uh, you don't do that for anything which has to do anything with Jews. You only want to say, uh, to make it totally clear to people that these guys are absolutely evil. And the metaphor of absolute evil is Hitler, Nazi, on the other side, the, the Holocaust. Now then you get to the question, which is my last chapter, and which Robert was so extremely kind to review before I published it, is how do you fight it? How do you fight it? Well. One of the things uh, which I try to explain very often, and uh, people think it's simply too complex, is that we live in a postmodern world. Postmodern world is a world which we cannot even properly define, so we relate it to a well definable period, of modernity. And then we say, uh, look, it came after modernity, so you have no pro problem in, in, in naming it. And in a fragmented world, as is our world, there is no simple answer. There are no single answers for any issues. So, if you want to know how are we going to fight it, education is part of the answer, but it's not the whole answer. You have to participate in public discourse, you have to continue research, you have to promote Holocaust education, you have to encourage visits to museums, monuments, you have to legislate against Holocaust denial, and uh, there are many other things. Uh, now, so far about the book itself and the Holocaust. Obviously, it would be very, very, very strange if the eight instruments of falsification, which I have developed in the book, could only be used for this very, very specific topic. That would mean that analysis of the Holocaust is something dramatically different from an anal analyzing any other complex subject in our society. So you have here these eight tools and 
These are eight tools for understanding complex phenomena in our society. Let me just take one uh, example which is close to our heart. Let's take the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and the behavior of the Arab world in general. And let's see what we can do with these tools. And I only throw out a paragraph or two just to, to show you that this is a virgin field in which some of you may wish to go further because there is enough place for a book there. Uh, okay. We all know Holocaust denial in the Arab world that is a bestseller, a great idea. But that's not the only denial in the Arab world. They also deny, uh, Arafat at top, that the Jews have any link to Jerusalem or the, to this geographic part in the world. So the, once you deny one thing and you are a crook in one field, you are a crook also in other fields. And uh, just one example. Uh, what equivalence? We've seen this equivalence, Bush, Hitler. Bush is Hitler, uh, Obama is a Nazi. Uh, this equivalence mm -hmm. we find in things which relate to the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict. Take the Goldstone Report, mm -hmm. the equivalence between Hamas and Israel as equal actors. Yeah, there's, there's nothing different than the technique which uh, the guys who shout at the tea parties Obama is a, is a Nazi. And <coughs> obliteration. This week we have heard that the Hebrew letters on the grave of the prophet Yechazkel in Iraq were removed, which is you obliterate the Jewish past. Not very, very different from uh, uh, burning down a Holocaust memorial on the island of Rhodes, which was destroyed uh, very rapidly uh, after it was uh, put up. Now, claiming that the Palestinians have no responsibility for their fate is a typical case of deflection and whitewashing. Uh, they participated in a war whose aim was the mass murder of the Jews and now suddenly they are victims. They have learned something from the Austrians. So, it's, it's structurally you can do tremendous things with these tools, which I haven't started and I also don't intend uh, because my, my interests go in other directions. But I just want to show that you can really do a lot with it. Finally, if the Vatican and the Middle Eastern bishops now declare that Christians are being chased out of the Middle East because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the, uh, the, the war in Iraq, you have a clear uh, case of deflection. The Muslim, uh, Muslim ideology, of course, has nothing to do with the burning of uh, churches in Malaysia. That would be a totally wrong thing. It's all because of what happens here and in Gaza and so on. So, you can do with this endless things. And I believe that if you want to use the instruments of this book, uh, you can do things which have really great analytical potential. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Martin. Before I ask for questions, um, I just think that the note that you ended up, the, the note that you ended with, is extremely important. This Holocaust inversion and all the other facets covered in that book are, to my mind, one of the greatest threats to the Jewish people today. It is a qualitative change in the anti-Semitic campaign against us, and the real thing that we should all absorb is. Nobody, but nobody, is going to fight this other than the Jewish people themselves. And I think that's extraordinarily important. We have no allies. We can bring in allies, but the initiative to fight this must come from us, must come from the Israeli government, and must come from the leaders of the Jewish people. And if we don't stand up on this issue, we stand historically condemned. Now I'm going to take uh, questions. Yes, I'm going to take them in groups of three. One, two, three. Um subject is so uh, painful and so important that it really must be approached with a lot of trepidation. So I'm going to be very careful what I say. Uh, I, I just want to make a couple of points. The question to Manfred would be on the, on the conscious or subconscious or unconscious motivations. Because the way uh, you put it in your lecture about what happened in Holland after the war was that there was 
manipulation of historical memory. Now that would imply that either the Dutch government or the Dutch media would have consciously manipulated the memory of their collaboration, the Dutch collaboration with the Nazis. Now my question is, would it not be possible that there was an unconscious or subconscious uh, defense here working in operation because of the because the fact that the Dutch cooperation with the Nazis was too painful for the Dutch to, to be aware of and to remember. I can give you another example in France. You know, in France there was of course a lot of collaboration with the Nazis. At the same time there was also a great deal of resistance. Now there was a very important film because uh, in the first lecture by Dr. Rosette we had heard about uh, films of the Holocaust and so on, which I'm going to speak to uh, very briefly also. Now, uh, in the film that was made, Le Chagrin et la Pitié, The Sorrow and the Pity, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the question of French collaboration with the Nazis was discussed in great detail and it was a very interesting film because it was made by interviewing people from all different uh, sides of this uh, story, Nazis, collaborators, resistance, Jews, and so on. Uh, but this film was not allowed to be shown on French television. It was only shown in select French cinemas, cinematics, and so on. So my question briefly is whether uh, you think that really all this uh, distortion of historical memory is conscious or whether there might be an unconscious defense here in operation. The second thing is about the film, about the lecture, the first lecture we heard, and you mentioned the film Holocaust. Now, um, I think, and other uh, important critics uh, of, the, of the film think, that the only two films of the Holocaust which are really quite good and pertinent were two films, one by Alain René, which is called Nuit et Brouillard, which was made in the 1950s, Night and Fog, which is taken from the famous Hitler Nacht und Nebel Befehl, uh, Night and Fog order to kidnap people, uh, and then they're not seen anymore. And the second film is, of course, Shoah by Claude Lanzmann. Both of them French films. Now, the other, uh, the other f uh, films, Holocaust and so on, my question to you, Dr. Rosette, would be, uh, is there not a price, a psychological price that we are paying for these films? Because these films are not as profound, not as complex, and not as, uh, let us say, comprehensive as the two films that I mentioned. So there is a certain, is there not a certain simplification here, not to say trivialization, of Holocaust memory. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Hi, it's always a pleasure to hear Dr. Malfred Gerstenfeld. He is one, and I'm coming from the Dutch community, and he's one of our most uh, outspoken speakers and uh, writers and thinkers. <coughs> and I will also want to say that uh, generally I agree with him on all his. Uh, Thing. But I want to go on to what you said in the end, and uh, is it that's the matter of what do we do? And here I have some, first of all, I'm a frank that the story happened in Holland. I remember discussions in, this, in the, at that time with Otto Frank, which is your father, here in Israel, and nobody in Israel, including Yad Vashem, was interested, not in the dairy, not in Bukha. Then he went to Holland, and then he gave that house there as a president and established a museum. Secondly, you are correct when you say that um, the Dutch people tried to, to make her a Dutch, um, a Dutch victim, which she was certainly not. When, if she would have come back from Bergen Belsen in 46 or in 45, she would have been put in a concentration camp like many others because she was a German citizen and not a Dutch citizen. Uh, another mark I want to make about um, about a part of Anna Frank is that we in Israel didn't want to didn't want at that time to tell a story. The other thing I want to say is about the we talked about what can we do. Now I want to say in Holland they established about I think four or five years ago in, in the University of Amsterdam a faculty for Holocaust and genocide. I went immediately there and said, how can you establish the Holocaust and genocide? I, 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 it is maybe, the Holocaust is a genocide, but it's not a study Holocaust and genocide. And then the man who proposed to them, the name, they told me, what do you want? You have Professor Bauer, and he is promoting this idea. We took his advice, he's a consultant from us, and we took from him this idea of genocide and thing, and it enabled the, the Dutch people all the time to talk about genocide and not only about the Holocaust. Uh, that's the the, uh, the the second thing I would like to say. The third thing I make 
I know that uh, Manfred is writing also the book about the negotiations about uh, the restitution in Holland in the 2000s. And I want to tell you, we had here this meeting with uh, Prime Minister Koch here in the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, and we immediately answered him on this point from this. He came from a poor family, from a father's family, from a six or seven children, but we immediately answered him, and there was one of the uh, our participant was an orphan. He said, I've been an orphan, my parents are murdered, and that made a deep impression on him. So, that is just a small correction on the, the I think, on the Thank excellent you. work. Thank you. Um, I have a very short question. Um, I forget the category, Manfred, where the Holocaust is not just a Jewish issue, but a much wider issue. What, equalization. Equalization. So, um, the name Holocaust is um, a Greek word, and we have another word, Shoah. I hope this is not too trivial a uh, question, but why did you choose Holocaust rather than a Jewish word like Shoah? Okay, gentlemen, who would like to start? Okay. Of course, there's only one question that was directed to me directly, and that's the question about the films. And that was the point I was trying to make, of course, that these films uh, are seen by many, many people and they only tell a certain part of the story and they are ultimately rather simplistic in the way they, they tell things or else they're just focused on one aspect of the Holocaust and not on other aspects. Um, films like Night and Fog, Night and Fog is a very important film. I, I think it mentions the word Jew once in the film, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but it was a very important early film and certainly Lansman Shaw yeah was also extremely important. I was just trying to talk about popularization, which is why I mentioned the particular films I mentioned there. We have, to, we have about close to 6,000 films cataloged about the Holocaust, the Yad Vashem. Um, and so there's been a lot of films that have been made over the years, and some of them only seen in a few cinematechs here and there, and some of them that had much wider representation. But no film can tell the whole story of it. <coughs> that doesn't happen. So there's, again, always an element <coughs> of simplification. Um, again, the other question, I, I, if I may, it was addressed to Manfred, but about the question of Holocaust and genocide that was brought up uh, inter alia. Um, once again, we go back that genocide as a definition includes two parts to it, really. One part, which we would probably, or we should call Holocaust, and the other part uh, is a different part. The first part of genocide talks about trying to destroy an entire people physically, and that's what the Holocaust was. The other part of genocide talks about destroying a group so it can no longer exist as a group. That means selective mass murder, it means destroying culture and other things. And they're two different but related phenomena. Putting Holocaust and genocide together is not, a, a, I don't think it's a wrong thing. It's just how you do it and how you discuss it. It's not, they belong together because Holocaust is a kind of genocide, really. But how do you discuss it? And the question is, again, if you talk about genocide without talking about Holocaust, that's where you have the problem versus perhaps putting them together to talk about. I think they belong together to a large extent. Yeah. <coughs> uh, let's take the easy questions first. Uh, Edward's question. Why Holocaust and not Shoah. As I explain also, or at least indicate in the book, it was a great mistake of the Jewish people to go for this word Holocaust. Holocaust has been, first of all it comes, it's of course a sacrifice, it's the Greek word for, for sacrifice. It had been used decades before in a diluted way for earthquake disasters in, uh, in California and so on. And it was, let's say, but you don't control it, it was a stupidity to go for it. And the French uh, never went for it. If you go to a French uh, audience, uh, you have to talk about Shoah, because that's the word which is known, and they are right. But I cannot write a book on a subject and try in the title to re-educate it in the world. Uh, you have to go for whatever has been, been known. and. Uh, that's the reality, and that's why I use Holocaust, but it is explained in the book. Uh, look, if we start talking about the Netherlands, Abraham knows that the story is endless. And the strange thing is that uh, it is really endless because uh, he told me that we have discovered another scandal in the last few weeks. 
but and a major scandal. But uh, the strange thing is, and then I also get already a bit into Arno's uh, 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 question. The Dutch were <laughs> relatively, of all the nations, the one who wanted to document the Second World War. They put up an institute very rapidly, a very good institute in Amsterdam for war documentation, which dealt not only with the Netherlands, also with Indonesia, uh, at least with the crimes in Indonesia by the Japanese, the crimes of the Dutch in, in, uh, in Indonesia, where they burned whole villages and killed more than 100,000 peop people in what they call police actions have never been properly investigated. That's an, <coughs> another story. Uh, so you had this, there was a parliamentary inquiry after the Second World War, which was quite good. Parliamentary inquiry history has been written by, by major scholars, but all of it didn't manage to suppress uh, the popular opinion, which, uh, well, the data were there. The data were there in the archives, the data were there in studies, uh, and uh, still there was this uh, uh, embellishment. Of course, it is extremely traumatic for a country to be overrun in four days uh, in a war which you could have seen coming for, de for a decade or seven years. That's very traumatic. Uh, it's also uh, very traumatic to have, uh, to have your queen run off to the United Kingdom without consulting her ministers and the ministers being instead, the ministers deciding, the ministers being forced to, uh, to run after the Queen. Uh, and then the Prime Minister really saying that it made all no, se no sense to be in London and this either returned or stayed in the Netherlands. It's a lousy story for, uh, for a country. Uh, it's also a lousy story to know that the son-in-law of the Queen then and the father of the present Queen had been an assessor in his youth, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, uh, which was known to the government in the Second World War that had just come out last week. And he only admitted it to, uh, in 2004 when he was dying. And uh, a friend of mine, and he has maintained that he was never a party member of the Nazi party and a friend of mine told me ten years ago that he had seen his membership card in the, uh, in the German archive which he didn't want to publish. But, so, uh, I mean, these are conscious things, obviously. Now, before I get to Darwin's question is, look, Abraham is totally right, this Holocaust and genocide studies, what all the thing in defense I can say is that the man who holds the position, Professor Howington Carter, deals very, very correctly with it. We have published him in Jewish Political Studies Review, we will publish him in the coming uh, uh, Jewish Political Studies Review. There is a problem with these Holocaust and Genocide studies. Uh, on the other hand, it has also has sometimes certain advantages, because it allows you to deal with the Holocaust and the Dutch role in Srebrenica at, at the same time. So you have here guys who already had the experience, they see it coming for a year and a half, then their soldiers, they don't do a thing. Their soldiers help separating the man from the woman. The men are handed over to the, Bosnia, to the Bosnian Serbs and are killed, 8,000 of them. Then the Dutch soldiers flee to Zagreb in Croatia. Uh, the Prime Minister and the Crown Prince and the Minister of Defense come over and they have a big beer party with music. So, uh, if you are a fun person who looks at the two phenomena, then the Dutch do an inquiry, not as we did in Sabra and Chatilla, where we were finally not the actors, not in seven months, it took them seven years. When the book came out, and it's absolutely unreadable, uh, it's 3,000 uh, pages, and I must say that the one thing uh, which I couldn't find, which I've written about, is how, uh, how they received prostitutes in the camp, and how they traded their, uh, uh, their equipment, uh, for all kinds of other goodies. I mean, the, the, is it in there? Nobody can ever find out because who can read 3,000 pages? Then they have seven months done this, uh, this study, seven years. And then when the study comes in the, uh, in the open, one of the ministers says, 
look, it is at the main conclusion that the government, when it decided to withdraw the soldiers uh, from uh, Srebrenica, didn't know that the, uh, that the, uh, the, the, the Bosnians were at risk. So, uh, that's already quite stupid. Uh, then the, uh, the minister, the Minister of Development Help, Pronk says, yeah, of course we knew, what kind of nonsense is this? So they studied seven years, <laughs> and the main conclusion is false. Good, then the second minister, or Deputy Prime Minister Borst, says, yeah, Pronk is right, we knew. So I interviewed her for my new book, and I asked her, well, can I clarify this, with you I only newspaper, art uh, newspaper articles did. You indeed say that you knew uh, at the time you were sitting there in the government and did you know that uh, these Bosnians were a risk to be killed? She said, of course. I mean, Pronk had his reasons because he was from another wing of the Labour Party to hit the Prime Minister, Koch, at the mm. time. But uh, he was right. We knew. So uh, all these things are extremely extremely touchy and there is an advantage of having the same guy look at Srebrenica and at the Holocaust in particular as in this case he's really a very good scholar. Uh, look, Avner, I think you ask a fascinating questions but there are some answers to this. I don't know. I think a psychologist could do better, much better than I on this whole issue. But we have two cases of where we know from later years that it was conscious. Small case the Dutch ambassador in Israel, Hellenberg Hubar, says we should not tell, we should not try to break the Dutch wartime myths. Because if, as long as the Dutch believe in the myth, then they will remain a tolerant people. If you tell them the truth about what they were, then also tolerance is being shaken. Okay, that is a little, all due respect. An, uh, an ambassador, uh, not the person who I made the key decision maker, but the other one, of course, is Mitterrand. Yeah. Mitterrand knows extremely well that the Fifth Republic is the legal successor of Vichy. He knows that and he doesn't want to admit it. There we have a, a strong, clear case of it is conscious. Chirac comes after him and he doesn't apologize, but he tells, yes, the Fifth Republic is the successor of, uh, of Vichy, and I'm ashamed about it. It's afterwards repeated uh, at the memorial functions by both uh, Prime Minister Jospin, the Socialist, and Villepin, when he is Prime Minister on behalf of the right wing UMP party. So we know that part of it, at least we have two good examples that it is conscious. Now there is certainly a subconscious element. Uh, it is very strange because in fact the Dutch media which survived the war, of which the main media, are all resistance media. Media which did not exist before the war. The main media, almost all of them, emerged from the resistance. Whereas the main paper which the Telegraaf the major collaborating uh, paper, now still again the largest Dutch paper, is being closed for a long time. So you would say that these resistance people had a genuine interest to tell the truth. Uh, they don't. Is it subconscious? Is it conscious? I, I don't know. Uh, look, you have the, one of the greatest Dutch scandals, the, uh, not scandals, but the statement. After the Second World War, the Minister of Transport, Van Schaik, a Catholic, 46, he, co he calls all the railway workers together who went on strike in 44 on a big square, giant square in The Hague, and he thanks them for not having gone on strike when the Jews were deported. He said, it, it was too early. When we called on you in 44, when we were advanced with the army to uh, to, uh, to strike, you listen to what we asked and we thank you for that. Now, uh, is that conscious, <laughs> better professional in that than I am? Is it subconscious? I mean, certainly uh, when it came up 50 years later, uh, uh, 
it was called the hardest by one of the papers, the harshest statement ever made by a Dutch minister. So uh, I think the two border on each other, the two are mixed, uh, both elements exist and I am not a professional in the field to separate them in much more detail. It's not bad for a non-professional. Right. Uh, yes. yes. And then uh, one, two, three. Right. Very I'd like to make a few points, uh, Manfred, you had mentioned that the Austrians claimed that they were the first victims of the Holocaust. Actually, they had received that status as a free gift from the Allies, who I think in 1942 declared them the first, the, the first victims of the Holocaust. Yes, that was one of the basis of the Atlantic Charter. So they, they, uh, they, they, uh, they made use of the free gift which they received. Now, with Holocaust denial, it has roots. Uh, there, were, there were writers in the first generation uh, in France, but one of the most important people was the Nazi propagandist hired by Nasser, and that was Johannes von Lehr, who was in charge of the uh, Nasser's propaganda, and he had an influence in the Arab world, and he had been associated with uh, Goebbels and later with Himmler. So there's a direct continuity, and von Lehr's corresponded with the Holocaust deniers throughout the 1960s and encouraged them to go in this direction. In other words, I'd like to say that our adversaries were very sophisticated and very professional and knew about propaganda in the most professional way. And it's indirectly related, but after the 1967 war, the German De Democratic Republic uh, opened up a propaganda assault against Israel, accusing Israel of being the aggressor. Of course, this was the support of the Soviets. But Simon Wiesenthal in 1967 listed about 15 of the newspaper editors and uh, directors of uh, radio and DDR, and they were all card-carrying card members of the Nazi party. So the uh, Zionism is racism, and the whole sophisticated uh, uh, approach has its roots, and, 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 and we have underestimated the adversary, and we have to do more to understand where they got these first myths from. With what's coming around has been around for quite a while. Now, Menashe Amir spoke about Holocaust denial in Iran, and he said one of the reasons that the Iranians wanted to attack Judaism is that it is the core of Christianity, and they want to attack Christianity. Now, we also have to talk or think about the threat that Judaism represents to people who have the, those interests. Judaism is a very strong religion and it can be the source or, uh, of resistance. And uh, uh, um, there's a certain amount of strength and independence about it and, and there's a reason why it may be uh, a target. The uh, Soviet dissident uh, Mendelevich, when he came, said when he was in the concentration camps when the, uh, of the Soviet Union, he said when the Ukrainians would come in, they would ask, where is the Zionist? Because the Zionists were the ones who he claimed who actually broke the Soviet Union. So there is something about the independence of mind and freedom, that go, and, and freedom of thought that goes with Judaism, which makes it a threat to people who would like to uh, remove freedoms from other people. Thank you. Sri? The lectures are great. I, I appreciate this opportunity to come and to listen to, the, to, the, to listen to these two great lectures. Uh, I want to suggest something uh, that the, uh, the incorrect use of the word Holocaust is similar to the incorrect use of anti-Semitism. Because when, when we speak about anti-Semitism, the Arab immediately say we are also Semites, so we cannot uh, include uh, us into this in, in this category. But my question is that uh, not question is a comment. This I think I believe now 
this is the first time in the history of uh, mankind that there is a coalition <coughs> of hatred toward Jews slash Zionist Israelis in the Arab world as well as in Europe. And we cannot and we should not deal with one with, with one type of anti-Semitism without dealing with the others. I think we have here a, this brochure by the ADL that shows the hatred in the Arab world is much greater and we should do something about it because we cannot only speak about the hatred in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, behind you, you've got the... Uh, it's a very short question to Manfred. Uh, I, many times when I was uh, in Belgium or in France, among the Christians, very close to the Pope, their icon is not Anna Frank, but it is Eti Ilson. I don't know why. Why? That, that's my question. And my remark is that uh, we were last year in Sachsenhausen, which is a concentration camp which is, we can see, included in Berlin. And my impression was terrible, because you only have monuments for the Soviet uh, army, soldiers, nothing from the Jew. And we had a very close friend who was 11 years in Sachsenhausen, and had uh, medical experiments which were done on him. So that is a denial of, uh, <coughs> of uh, the destruction of the Jew, of German Jew, in the, in the heart of Berlin, in yeah. the camp. Thank you. You are, you are, of course, right on the Nazi role in Holocaust denial. Uh, and the Nazi, look, if you are a neo-Nazi, you have great interest to... I mean, the Borlipstadt, and we have also published that in an interview I did with her in great detail. Uh, what move, motivates Irving? What motivates Irving uh, is that he would like to have a new Nazi state. And in order to do that, you have to do a certain number of things. Uh, you have to whitewash the you have to whitewash Hitler, that is the central point. The first thing you have to to do is uh, that you have to blame other people, junior people. Hitler didn't know, that is the classic Irving statement. Hitler didn't know it was done by other people. There is no proof that Hitler ever ordered this, he, he says. The, he didn't know. Then uh, you blame the atrocities on the Baltic soldiers, uh, on the Ukrainians, uh, and occasional incidents by, by Germans who didn't follow discipline. And then, if you haven't then done the lot, you, the rest you deny. So it's a complex matter uh, what approaches this. And we, in our naivete, also Deborah Lipstadt herself, of course, coming out of a two-year two -year process in London, thought it was over by that time. In fact, Holocaust denial today, ten, ten years later, is infinitely bigger than it has uh, been for a long time. In fact, as was mentioned here, Holocaust denial after the war was a question of nutcases to a large extent. Uh, you could list, if you read uh, Deborah Lipstadt, also is, uh, a certain respect for people who can read all this junk and write an academic piece on it. Uh, because if you look at the names she brings, Bardesh, Racinier, uh, Faurisson, later, I mean, uh, to, devote, uh, to, to devote a book to these guys is really a major effort for a person with, uh, who, who has a healthy mind. Uh, today we uh, Today it's a mass phenomenon, Ahmadinejad has largely uh, contributed uh, to it. And uh, as you say, Van Leers and these people, they have all had their interest. And it is important for neo-Nazis and with the coming up of the right, the new right, and partly the neo-Nazi right, uh, as a reaction in part to, uh, to the extrava uh, extravagant behavior of part of the Muslim immigrants in Europe, 
then uh, you uh, you will see we will see more of it rather than less of it as we thought. Look, the anti-Semitism issue is an is an old is an old issue. In fact, that is the big debate. Uh, of course, anti-Semitism had nothing to do with Semites. Was an expression for hatred of the Jews coined in the 19th century by Wilhelm Marr, who apparently, after a long time, suddenly regretted that he had done it. And that's the big debate: Do you put a dash between anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism, or don't you put a dash between? If you take out the dash, the the theory is then the Arabs can no longer claim that it has something to do being against Semites. These are all uh, all. Uh, you cannot do anything about it. If they had called it Judeophobia from the beginning, we would have been much better off. But you cannot, it's like Shoah and Holocaust, you cannot now take a term which is so deeply anchored in Western language and say we're going to find a better term for it. That is only counterproductive. True what you uh, say about Sachsenhausen, so no Jews who were in Sachsenhausen, but, uh, it started immediately after the war. Uh, I heard once at the, pre at the president's uh, the thing of Yad Vashem, and the, at the president, uh, Rabbi Lau spoke. And he uh, said, well, after the war in the camp I was, there a monument went up for those who had been died. And then somebody stood up uh, that the Jews are not on the monument. And he was beaten up by the others who said Jews are not, uh, are not a nation. Mm. And that's, and the other side of it, when the Pope, uh, Jean-Paul II, comes to Auschwitz, he says six million Poles have died yeah. in the war, yeah. uh, which translates into three million Jews and uh, three million other Poles. And, uh, well, Minerbi, who has this sensitivity, says, the figure of six million, of course, was not, was not uh, incidental in this whole thing. But the issue is, they were never, it's by the way true in France as well, they were never Frenchmen when they lived, but when they died, they died as Frenchmen. That is the kind of uh, intellectual exercises which uh, French intellectuals are particularly good in. Just two last comments. Uh, part of what I think Sachsenhausen's about, but other places as well, again, it's the long history of uh, the communist uh, influence on, on the history and the de Judaizing of it. It's just now that in Auschwitz they're finally working on a new museum, a core museum, and they're redoing the Jewish house, whatever it is, the Jewish exhibit at Auschwitz. It's a long process, it took a long time. I mean, things changed a long time ago, but in terms of the politics, but it takes a long time to see the reflection of what's going on there. In a few years, there will be new exhibits there that will have the Jews much more in the center, I hope. Um, I think also that in the former communist world, part of what goes on here, the motivations is in, this, in trying to build new states. And certainly the younger politicians, the men that today, some of them are only in their 30s and 40s, some men with leading positions in these countries, they're quite young, they grew up in a world where they were fed disinformation. They don't really know much better. And that always reminds me when I was in, uh, in Hungary during the first Lebanese war and the casualty reports were coming out and my Hungarian relatives were saying to me, you know, there so many Israelis were being killed and I was, I managed somehow to get BBC and I listened to the real numbers and I explained to them that, that, that what they were hearing wasn't right. They said, of course it wasn't right, but they thought it wasn't right by a factor of half. But it was exaggerated by 900% what they were hearing. And it's the same problem. I think some of these younger politicians and younger people in the former Eastern Bloc know that what they learned isn't right, but they haven't yet figured out that what they were taught was so wrong, that it's so off base, and that they have to get, it's not 50% wrong, but they get 100% wrong. The other thing I wanted to mention is that in terms of um, motivations, again, there's a very interesting thing that's going on in the Institute for Historical Review out in California, and there's a fellow named Mark Weber that's very central to what they do, and he not too long ago started telling his peers that they have to stop denying the Holocaust because it was doing a disservice to their campaign against Israel. And I think in that we see a couple of things. First of all, we see clearly why Holocaust denial is anti-Semitism from what he said, but even more the manipulative part. I mean, it's something that's being thought. It's not just something that they do because whatever, they're full of hatred, they're thinking about what they're doing, and they're doing it 
again, in a very conscious way. And if they lessen the denial coming out of the Institute for Historical Review in the end, it'll be because they have a greater goal and they decided that it's not serving the goal so well. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite you to join me in thanking our speakers for very, very much.